Good evening and welcome you watching NDTV. I am Vedant Agarwal. Our non-stop coverage of the Prime Minister's crucial visit to the US. Well, it's a bilateral and a multilateral visit. But the focus right now is the crucial bilateral meeting with President Joe Biden. The visuals that you see on your screen are from Philadelphia, where the Indian diaspora really rolled out a red carpet for Prime Minister. A lot of color, excitement, anticipation, uh, dance and music as the Prime Minister arrived at the Philadelphia airport uh, in the US. Of course, uh, the diaspora outreach is such an important part of the Prime Minister's visits abroad. Uh, but there's a lot on agenda when it comes to business, given the fact that the Prime Minister will be hold, uh, you know, was holding the crucial bilateral with President Biden uh, at his hometown in Wilmington. And this is the first time that President Biden, in fact, has uh, hosted Prime Minister Modi uh, at his hometown and the other quad leaders as well, uh, including the Australian Prime Minister, also uh, even the Japanese Prime Minister. So it's going to be extremely crucial. We are counting down to that crucial bilateral. Uh, the Prime Minister is on his way to Wilmington from Philadelphia. We'll get you all the ground action as well. But what all is on agenda when it comes to the bilateral? Well, certainly two key agreements are likely to be inked. Defence, security, innovation, these are key areas. But of course, the larger questions of uh, the geopolitics, the larger question of a lasting peace solution uh, when it comes to uh, what's happening in Ukraine as well as in Gaza. The Prime Minister is uh, meeting with uh, Putin as well as Zelensky is also something that could be brought up in that crucial bilateral that will be held uh, at the at President Joe Biden's residence in Wilmington. Uh, so, of course, um, varied issues likely to be discussed in that bilateral. Uh, but of course, when it comes to Quad, the focus is on countering China, uh, given the fact that you know this is an organization, this is a formation uh, that was dormant largely uh, for a decade after its formation. But uh, with the ri rising Chinese footprint, the rising Chinese aggression, uh, the Quad summit becomes crucial as well, after which the Prime Minister is also expected to uh, make an address at the UN building. So that's going to be crucial as well. Um, you know, a rare honor in that sense. Of course, India has been pushing for a seat in the UNSC. Various uh, global partners have backed India in its pursuit of that uh, UNSC seat as well. So in that sense, geopolitically, diplomatically, a very, very crucial visit. It's a three-day visit. This, of course, uh, comes after the Prime Minister's state visit last year where he addressed the U.S. Congress also for the second time, a rare honor. There was a state dinner hosted by President Joe Biden as well. So that was really a crucial visit. Many call it the turning point uh, in India's relationship with the U.S. The focus very much was on semiconductor and looking at supply chains. Uh, so a lot uh, is on agenda. Uh, and we will uh, keep tracking all of that. Uh, but what we are being told is that the Prime Minister is expected to begin that bilateral shortly. Uh, we will, of course, get deferred visuals of uh, the Prime Minister meeting President Joe Biden and that's going to be crucial. A larger message, geopolitical message also being sent out uh, uh, given the fact that it is a largely unstable geopolitical environment uh, with two wars raging on in Gaza as well as uh, in Ukraine. Of course, the Prime Minister has talked about finding solutions outside of the battlefield. And that is something that, in a sense, U.S. has also backed India on. The Prime Minister has reiterated his message that this is not an era of war in multiple international forums, and he's expected to do that in that bilateral with President Biden, also um, in the Quad Summit as well. It's a summit of the future, that's what it's being called. Um, and apart from the larger hard issues of uh, security and military. It's also about, uh, you know, very important and pressing global issues like climate change, artificial intelligence. Of course, all of that um, is also going to be on agenda. Let me introduce my panel this evening. Well, I'm being joined by Adele Malka Nazarian, an American media personality and political analyst. Also Seema Sirohi, a columnist and author of uh, uh, India, you uh, know, in book on, on India-U.S. relations, uh, Friends with Benefits is what it's titled. Also, Dr. Swasti Rao, Associate Fellow, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, uh, Europe and Eurasia Center. Thanks all very much for being with us. Um, Mr. Roy, going across to you first. How do you see the Prime Minister's crucial visit? Well, 
um, as I said right uh, at the outset, that this is a bilateral as well as a multilateral uh, relationship. But, you know, looking specifically as, at India's relationship with the U.S., it has transformed a great deal in the past five years particularly. When President Biden took over, there was great skepticism. In fact, the refrain was, will Biden continue to double down on India? But look at where we are today. You know, we've come a long way indeed. Absolutely. Uh, it's a very crucial visit because it cements what uh, India and the U.S. have achieved over the last four years. It's a kind of goodbye visit to, you know, saying goodbye to President Biden, who was very crucial in sort of adding more layers, not only to the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, for which the Prime Minister is here, but also to the bilateral U.S.-India relationship. Uh, you're right that when President Biden came into office, there was some amount of worry hmm. whether uh, the relationship would strengthen or whether it would get mired in criticism. So uh, Biden proved everybody wrong. Uh, this summit will consolidate the gains of the Quad. Some new announcements are expected. Uh, like Maritime Domain Awareness uh, Initiative will be extended to the Indian Ocean region. Yes. So that's one big thing. There'll be an announcement on the Cancer Moonshot. That is President Biden's personal uh, kind of um, issue. He was very keen and then India, Australia and Japan joined him in that. So, yes, there will be a bilateral meeting. Uh, I think they're going into it right now, uh, President Biden yes. and Prime Minister Modi. They are going to talk about the defense relationship for sure, uh, because that is, uh, in my opinion, the strongest pillar of our bilateral relations. Uh, the relationship has gone, uh, you know, from just buying U.S. equipment to actually co-producing jet yes. engines. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really how important I would point you're it. making that you know our defense partnership has really expanded from just buying defense equipment to co-producing and also looking at it from an innovation perspective. I think that's also and defense research. I think that's interesting there. But Dr. Swasti Rao, uh, what Ms. Sirohi uh, said about uh, maritime relations and about the Indian Ocean that's extremely critical, isn't it? Given yeah. the fact that we've seen the kind of aggression, uh, say what happened in the South China Sea, and of course uh, the rising Chinese footprint as well. In that context, how do you see the Quad leaders collaborating and sort of arriving at some sort of a consensus and some sort of an attempt to, in a sense, counter a rather aggressive China? Well, a very good evening to you, Vedant, and it's uh, really nice to see, uh, you know, Seema and because Seema's book, uh, which is uh, Estrangement to Engagement, which is on the U.S.-India yes. relationship, is one of my most favorite books, actually. <laughs> so I think you got the right person to speak on U.S.-India relations. Uh, coming back to the question that you asked me about maritime domain awareness and all that, I think at the heart of the Indo-Pacific construct, let's remember that it is a maritime imagination. You know, mm. it is a strategically important maritime domain. And that domain is very crucial because that is the domain where we see a unilateral status quo change, uh, at least attempts, and of course, also not just attempts, but also examples uh, by this one country. Uh, you know, to our east. And we also see uh, that this this entire uh, region is extremely important for the various sea lanes of communication, etc. Now, uh, very quickly, when you are trying to put together a kind of a security architecture, or you're trying to sort of uh, uphold the rules-based order, you're trying to give certain solutions to the security anxieties of a maritime uh, domain, I think at the heart of all of these things actually lie the maritime domain awareness. And that mm. is the reason why we saw in 2022 the court coming up with this IPMTA, which meant Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness, uh, you know, this initiative. Mm. Now, um, what you what you're seeing now is that um, 
Uh, you said that MDA is going to be extended to the Indian Ocean region. Of course, MDA is going to be extended to the Indian Ocean region. I think what is more important this time is that they are going to have some more um, solid dialogue on how to control illegal fishing. Uh, whenever it is about these kind of things, you would require a lot of uh, you know talking among your partners because all these kind of uh, initiatives would have technological implications and strategic implications as well. Mm. And one thing that uh, people uh, sometimes do not understand understand very well about MDA is that um, you know you don't really start with MDA by signing an agreement MDA at the heart is a kind of a you know collection of a maritime domain awareness which also has inputs of maritime intelligence and maritime information you see the problem is that even though we have an IFC IOR kind of center in Gurugram etc uh, the real problem that we face whenever we are speaking either to the court partners or whoever I mean this also happens when we're speaking to Brussels for instance which is that you know so far we are not talking in the in the common maritime semantics, which means that the kind of information portals that uh, these actors are using, and this is quite technical, uh, these are different. So then what happens is that you can perhaps in a, on a case to case basis, you know, you can probably get together and uh, sort of put your act together. But it is not the same as saying that there is a real time linking of information exchange. Hmm. So I think, I think that's a very important uh, point you're really, making. Yes, that's a very yeah. important point you're yeah. making. And Adele, would you like to come in on this? You know, the, the largest sense in America, the largest sentiment vis-a-vis uh, -vis Prime Minister Narendra Modi, do you see a change or a shift perhaps uh, in terms of how America looks at India? Because now it's very much a, a relationship between two equals almost, um, given the fact that, you know, we have seen that uh, uh, President Biden has said this time and again that India is extremely important for the U.S. Uh, and also India is all among the uh, larger suppliers of manpower, of human resources. I mean, the IT professionals uh, in, in the U.S. are extremely critical. So what is the sense? Do you see this sort of paradigm shift in the way the U.S. views India? Hi, I certainly certainly do. I think that we've seen with the supply chain diversification also that is provided with the U.S.-India relationship in, as opposed to China, which was the key, key supply chain provider in the past. I think that we've seen a tremendous shift. I think what we're also seeing, um, sorry, I have my, my baby with me. Um, what we're also seeing is that the on defense technology and sharing, there's going to be a lot more reliance on U.S., on, on, sorry, on India than over China, especially when it comes to the national security and defense issues. Mm. So we're going to see, of course, um, a shift away from you know, kind of the Sino-U.S. relationship that was marked by previous administrations and which was started, honestly, more strongly by the Trump administration and leading into the Biden administration, um, a, a stronger focus on the U.S.-India relationship. And I think it's going to be a positive all around. Um, I do also see bilateral trade seeing an, uh, more of a push. I also see that there's, you know, for example, those materials that are required for technology and whatnot, um, we're not going to, for, for defense capabilities, we're going to see the quad meetings that are going to also discuss that. Mm. But more so, I think that overall, in a geopolitical sense, um, India has been more of a peacemaker, of course, which is very important diplomatically. I always have this saying, it goes, dip diplomacy never works until it does. And I do see Narendra Modi being kind of a catalyst for that. Okay. And Adele, Adele uh, hold on to your thoughts. Uh, let me go straight across to our senior colleague Vishnu Shom, in fact, who is joining us from Wilmington. Vishnu, it's over to you. What's happening? Uh, is a bilateral meeting underway? Uh, when is it expected to begin? So that bilateral meeting will begin in a short while from now. I'm outside the residence of President Joe Biden. Uh, this is where the motorcade of Prime Minister Modi is going to be passing through. They'll be entering through these gates. Uh, that The building behind that you can see uh, over there is uh, just behind me, in fact. The building, the, the house that you see over there is part of the property of the residence of uh, President uh, Joe Biden. Now, we expect that bilateral process to take place in a little while from now. The motorcade is expected. We'll get just a glance of the motorcade and then perhaps uh, uh, more images of Prime Minister Modi uh, shaking the hand of, uh, of President Biden. Uh, later on, there are uh, just official media, one or two uh, media allowed inside. But we are uh, the only private network, in a sense, over here with perhaps just one other private network. Uh, and, uh, you know, it gives us a sense of where President, uh, what President Biden calls home. It's a beautiful part uh, in Wilmington. 
uh, in the state of Delaware. Uh, this is where um, uh, the bilateral meeting will take place and the Quad Summit will be in this area uh, as well as I understand it. Um, but the bilateral process is so very important for all of the reasons which we've been discussing for the last uh, couple of days. Uh, India and the United States have this incredible strategic relationship. It's a pretty unthinkable uh, to look at where we were, let us say, even 20 years back and where we are now. Uh, there are differences in the relationship, but both countries strive to sort out the differences. But the bedrock of that relationship, uh, there are quite a few of them, in fact. One of them, of course, the human-to-human -human connect, the fact that we are large democracies, the fact that education is so important, and then, of course, there's the incredible economic relationship and the defense relationship. So when Prime Minister Modi comes over here and speaks to President Biden, uh, that relationship is underwrit by all of these factors which I discussed. Now, in terms of specifics, what we expect Prime Minister Modi to do is to brief President Biden on his talks with uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, we do expect some conversations to take place uh, as well about his recent visit to Ukraine uh, and India's role as uh, a leader of the Global South uh, and in trying to address the concerns which affect millions around the world, uh, and that is the war in Eastern Europe. Uh, there is an element of, I won't use the word tension, but perhaps discomfiture at the fact that less than 24 hours prior to this visit, we've seen um, the United States uh, uh, meeting uh, members of uh, uh, who we associate with, Khal uh, with Khalistani extremism over here. This comes at a time when the United States has been trying to uh, legally pursue cases against uh, the National Security Advisor and others in connection with the Gurwant, uh, in connection with the, uh, with the Pannun case, where the United States alleges uh, an assassination plot uh, committed uh, on Indian soil, India, of course, says that you know we are carrying out investigations and that we are being transparent in the process of doing that. Uh, so be that as it may, uh, I do expect that to perhaps be a part of these talks. It may not be an overwhelming part of these talks, but certainly one factor. Uh, so you know, several areas uh, which India and the United States will be looking at today, and this, of course, is part one of the visit. Then there is the Quad Summit as well, and the Quad Summit brings together the leaders of of Japan, um, of. Uh, uh, of Australia, of, of India, and of course of the United States. Uh, and that has a separate agenda that is underwrit by the fact that there is a growing expansionism of China at so many levels. I'm not just talking about uh, at the military level, but certainly at um, in terms of establishing a greater presence across the Indian Ocean region and the Asia-Pacific region. China has so many problems uh, with nations across the region, whether it is in the Spratly Islands or it's uh, in the Himalayan frontier, which we have with China. Problems with a small country like Bhutan, for example. Uh, while the Quad isn't uh, explicitly a military organization, it isn't a military organization, it is more a, a, you know, a, a, an organization that frames the, the, the diplomatic way forward of all of these nations on the basis of, uh, of their economic uh, and, de and democratic uh, collective. It, on the sidelines of Quad, however, are the Malabar series of uh, naval exercises, which all of these nations participate in. So there is that mili military element as well, perhaps far less overt than what we see with the AUKUS grouping, which sees France, Australia, the United States and Japan in a, in a larger military sort of framework. So that's the overall sort of basis of the, of the relationship that Quad nations enjoy. Uh, and all of that we'll see uh, with, uh, with joint statements, uh, you know, in the hours ahead. Absolutely, Vishnu. And it's so symbolic in a sense that the Prime Minister will be hosted uh, at Joe Biden's residence uh, in Wilmington. Um, you know, you've been covering this so closely. Break it down for us because the Biden years have been extremely crucial for the India-US relationship. There was a lot of skepticism earlier. The refrain was, will Biden continue to double down on India and look at where we are? So what have been some of the key milestones as far as the India-US relationship is concerned in the Biden years? Well, I think it's not just the Biden years, Vedant. Let me suggest that there has been continuity in foreign policy for the United States with regard to India and continuity in foreign policy for India with regard to uh, the United States as well. The evolution of this relationship, which has taken place for more than 15 odd years, is on the basis of India and the United States signing several uh, foundational agreements. Uh, there's SISMOA, there is LEMOA, um, you know, then there are several other agreements. These are legal requirements in the United States on the basis of which the United States could, for example, transfer sensitive military technology to India or, for example, share um, uh, sensitive information, uh, geospatial information as well, communications between Indian military systems and Western military systems or American military systems through encrypted communication systems. So this is important. It underwrites uh, the, uh, the defense 
relationship, then this has also enabled the sale of state-of-the-art weaponry between India and the United States. So all of this took time. And of course, there was the landmark India-United uh, States uh, civil nuclear deal. Uh, that deal has certainly not reached its true potential, but the fact that there has been the availability of state-of-the-art um, uh, United States-built um, uh, nuclear reactor technology to India is something which sort of really took that relationship forward. And now here you have, uh, you know, this, the relationship uh, with, with Joe Biden. Yes, of course, there is the Pandun issue, which has been a, I wouldn't use the word setback, but certainly a challenge within the relationship. But there has been this affirmation on both sides that, look, you know, it's not a, a showstopper. It is uh, something which needs to be addressed by both sides, and that is being done. Uh, but the broad economic relationship, the fact that uh, India and the United States under Joe Biden, and this is to come to your to your question specifically, are looking at resilient supply chains for semiconductors. They're looking at climate change technology being transferred to India. Um, uh, the fact that there is a defense relationship, which I spoke about. There are health issues as well, medical uh, sort of uh, issues which are being dealt with by both countries and at the level of the Quad, of course, uh, there is cervical cancer and vaccination among Quad nations, which will be a big takeaway as well at some stage today. Um, but uh, so many other areas, jet engine technology being transferred from America uh, to India, the fact that General Electric is going to be manufacturing jet engines in India, that's a very big deal as well. Uh, the Tejas Mark II fighter will be powered by uh, American-designed engines, but those primarily manufactured in India. Jet engine technology is the holy grail of military aviation. It is the holy grail of aviation. Very few countries have uh, that technology. And the fact that the U.S. is willing uh, to transfer a lot of that to India you know, gives you another idea of how deep the technology sharing issue is. Then, of course, there are Indian astronauts or an Indian astronaut who will be going to the International Space Station in the next couple of months. ISRO in a fairly deep relationship with NASA at this stage. Uh, this has nothing to do, per se, with the uh, Gaganyaan program, uh, which uh, is separate and is India's indigenous effort. Uh, but the fact that we will have um, an Indian... Excuse me, sir, could you just uh, step a little bit to the side? Thank you. Uh, the fact that you will have um, an Indian uh, astronaut on the International Space Station, the fact that NASA and ISRO are working so closely together, uh, is another area where that relationship has really gone, for, gone forward. So there, there you have, you know, some of the key issues which, uh, or come of the, some of the key themes where India, where Washington and uh, New Delhi have really worked on. But once again, I'm outside the residence of President Joe Biden. Uh, it's in this road over here that we'll see the motorcade of Prime Minister Modi pass by. Uh, they'll be entering over there, the building behind me, uh, right over there. It's part of the property of the residence of President Biden. Um, and, you know, so there'll be that bilateral talk. We, there will be a bilateral statement, we are told. Um, and, of course, the court process at the end of which we'll see uh, perhaps more statements being released. Back to you. Absolutely, Vishnu. You've largely covered what all is expected as far as the bilateral is concerned. But you, uh, you made an interesting point that there's largely been continuity when it comes to India's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Given the fact that you know, perhaps a change of, the, uh, change of guard is in the offing, do you see that continuity to, uh, to sort of, in a sense, uh, uh, be the defining factor as far as the India-U.S. relationship is concerned? Or do you see priorities changing? No, I don't see priorities changing. I think the U.S. has affirmed its commitment to uh, taking this relationship up uh, to the next level. Uh, remember, the bedrock of this relationship at many levels is the human-to-human -human connect. The fact that uh, Indians of uh, non-resident Indians are swimming brilliantly over here. They are one of the most uh, uh, successful uh, groups in the United States. Uh, professionally, they've been very, very successful. They, they you know, as a per, ca per capita average of income, they perhaps earn uh, more than any other socio-economic group in the United States. Uh, the fact that uh, the Silicon Valley itself has had an incredible participation of Indians. The fact that you've had an Indian participation and involvement in several American uh, state uh, companies in the IT sector. And that's reflected by the fact that uh, Prime Minister Modi will be meeting CEOs very shortly. In fact, uh, tomorrow, the CEOs of several leading IT firms in New York. Um, the fact that you've got Indian students going to, to the United States every single year, record numbers. There is always this pressure of, uh, of visas being delivered uh, to students, of visas being delivered to, to families who want to keep up the connect uh, you know, across the world. So, I mean, that's something that uh, both sides are really looking uh, closely at. Uh, if there is one area of strain, and we don't talk about it enough, is the fact that America is just unable to process enough visas for Indians looking to travel abroad. That there are sometimes delays which take place even for students 
visas uh, that you know families are not able uh, to get those visas at a time which they really want. But the Americans say that look, they are stepping up their processes. They say that our processes are slow. It, it, they do not really take into account uh, the number or the volume that they need to deal with. So that's something that's uh, you know something in the works. Uh, it sometimes takes years before people can travel, and that's something clearly that the Americans need to fix. Absolutely, Vishnu. Many challenges there as well. Thanks very much for joining us with the latest from outside uh, Biden's residence. This, as uh, the bilateral, the crucial bilateral, uh, is set to begin in a short while from now. Thanks very much, Vishnu. And our wonderful panel uh, this evening will also continue to be with us as this remains our top focus here on NDTV. But for now, a short break. Hello and welcome. I'm Vishnu Shom in Wilmington in Delaware in the United States where Prime Minister Modi gets set for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the US President Joe Biden. Also a very important meeting of the Quad grouping. He has a huge presence over here. He's very popular among non-resident Indians. There'll be a massive community event in a few days. We would have never uh, had a chance to uh, get this encounter and so we're super excited. There's a lot more opportunities in India and it's a, it's a growing economy. It's a great opportunity. Very excited. And he'll also be speaking to CEOs and at an important international conference. I'll bring you all the details on the ground right here on NDTV 24-7. Welcome back. Our non-stop coverage of the Prime Minister's three-day power-packed visit to the U.S. Of course, a lot is on agenda. And the crucial bilateral meeting between uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Joe Biden is expected to begin shortly. But this time, interestingly, at uh, President Biden's residence in Wilmington, the first time that he's hosting world leaders at his residence. Also a farewell gesture, in a sense, uh, to President Biden, given the fact that this is his last uh, Quad summit as well before um, he retires uh, before before his term comes to an end. Uh, well, joining me this evening, Adele Malka Nazarian, uh, you know, an American media personality and a political analyst. Also, Seema Sirohi, columnist uh, and author of a book on India-U.S. relations, Friends with Benefits, the India-U.S. story. Adele, I had to cut you short earlier. Go ahead and tell us what you were talking about. And also, uh, you know, it's an extremely interesting time in the U.S. A change of a, a change of guard is in the offing. Uh, but what's clear is that U.S., irrespective of whether it's uh, uh, the Democrats or the Republicans at the helm, views India really as a trusted and permanent friend. Absolutely. And it's, it's great to be on with you again. You know, if we think about it, there's over 4.8 million Indian Americans living in the U.S., American Indians. And they are representing among the wealthiest, most educated communities in the country, um, playing, cr playing crucial roles, increasing roles in politics, business, academia, right? Think about the number of visas. I think in 2023 alone, the U.S. issued over 1.4 million visas to Indian citizens, making India one of the largest contributors to the U.S. economy, both in skilled labor and educational exchanges, right? Then you have the geopolitical issues, right? You have the counterbalancing of China, of course, which in India's defense partnerships with the U.S. obviously have grown significantly, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, eight years ago, I was talking about how important it is for the U.S. to take India as a very serious strategic ally and partner on the global stage for these issues and more. And it's an energy. I just want to also point out bilateral trade between both yes. countries, right? It's an all-time high it was reached in terms of bilateral trade between India and the U.S., in 2022, with 191 $191 billion in assets that were traded between the two countries. Sorry about that. Um, I think that what we're seeing here is, you're right, Without, regardless of whether it's a Trump administration or a continuation of the Biden administration under Kamala Harris, the in, India will remain a crucial and viable partner mm. for the U.S. Yes. on That's the global stage point. In diplomatically. Fact, it's also important what you what you said about the Indian diaspora playing a crucial yes. role, um, you know, economically, which is why this relationship, uh, Mr. Rohi, has in a sense transformed to a more symbiotic relationship a more you know a relationship between equals why do you think that you know this diaspora diplomacy is such a cornerstone as far as india's relationship with the us is concerned whether it whether it's what we saw in terms of the layoffs there were some concerns uh, on the part of the it professionals whether it's reverse migration you know those are issues that are extremely important as well 
Right. The diaspora is extremely important in this relationship. The people to people connection. I think, you know, let's look at China. They don't have the same thing that Indian Americans do. Hmm. Um, the four million odd Indian Americans here. Uh, look at the Biden administration. There are more than 150 Indian Americans at various levels of government, including at some very high levels. You have a presidential candidate now, currently the vice president who is uh, Indian American. The rival vice presidential candidate's wife is an Indian American. Mm. So uh, the kind of uh, diaspora presence, the importance, the contributions, because don't forget, the best and the brightest from India uh, came here because of the way the U.S. immigration policy worked. And then a lot of the students stayed back here to uh, to work. Right. So it's become a bridge in the relationship. And going forward, it will play a very crucial role. But I wanted to add one point about bipartisanship. The uh, This is the only issue. India is the only relationship, I would say, on which there is bipartisan consensus. Yes. Both Republicans and Democrats want the relationship to, uh, relationship to be stronger. Just yesterday, the House and the Senate, the House created a quad caucus, caucus yes. on the quad, hmm. where uh, both Republicans and uh, Democratic congressmen came together. Senate passed a resolution saying that the quad of which India is an extremely important pillar, is now the centerpiece of the U.S. foreign policy. Mm. So if India is part of uh, the American, you know, uh, crucial part of the American foreign policy objectives, then you can see the relationship is on a very solid footing. Mm. I, I feel the trajectory is going to only go in a positive direction, what the Biden administration has done, which is something that should be noted by people in Delhi, is uh, it has compartmentalized the troubling, the troublesome areas, you know. Mm. So supposing there's a hiccup in the relationship, for example, the alleged assassination plot. Yes. Mm. The Biden administration did not allow that to overshadow mm. other parts of the relationship. And that's something... So I think that's an that important point you're well making, that we are, we are at a stage where our bilateral relations have, in a sense, transcended these minor challenges. I'll come back to you, Mr. Rohi, on the Khalistan aspect, because I think that's important. Uh, but we also have a readout of President Biden's meeting with... Um, uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, in fact. And one of the paragraphs actually is, talks about what they discussed vis-a-vis -vis China. So the leaders discussed their respective diplomacy with the People's Republic of China and their shared concerns about China's coercive and destabilizing activities, including in South China Sea. They also reaffirmed their commitment to developing and protecting critical and emerging technologies. Uh, but Dr. Swasti Rao, so there... This seems to suggest that there is a very open discussion uh, as far mm. as, you know, the China challenge or the Chinese threat is concerned. And that is something we can expect uh, in the Quad Summit as well for, a, for an organization or for a formation that was largely dormant till 2017. Uh, you know, the China yeah. challenge is something that's an extremely pressing one. Well, absolutely. I mean, where is the doubt uh, about the fact that, uh, yes, the elephant in the room has been China. And when it is yeah. about court, of course, it is about China. The only thing uh, with respect to China that we need to keep in mind is that I think India's policy of uh, China agnosticism uh, would continue when it comes to formal statements, because uh, ultimately, it's in our favor, you know. Um, All right, so Dr. Swasti Rao, uh, continue to be with us. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but we're getting live pictures of Prime Minister Modi arriving at uh, President Joe Biden's residence in Wilmington uh, for the crucial bilateral meeting. Uh, we'll try and uh, get those pictures on air. Uh, these are visuals, in fact, from Wilmington, from outside uh, President Joe Biden's residence, where my colleague Vishnu Shom has been reporting from. And the Prime Minister's motorcade has arrived there, is uh, the information that we're putting out right now. Uh, extremely important there that bilateral is uh, set to begin in just a short while from now. Yes, Dr. Swasti Rao, go ahead. 
Well, so very quickly, like I said, that we would, I think, from India's perspective, uh, this China agnosticism is going to continue when it comes to formal statements. Because you see, one uh, one of the things, uh, one of the narratives that the Chinese Communist Party has been uh, extending with respect to India's engagement at the Quad is that uh, uh, you know, Quad is a nation, NATO, etc. And if you really speak to the Chinese, I mean, I was there. For, a month ago when I was speaking to uh, their strategic experts on Europe and the war in Indo-Pacific. And I think they actually sort of live in a very alternative uh, reality, which is that it, according to them, India is the major destabilizer. So anyway, what I'm coming to the, uh, to, to the point that I wish to sort of convey is that um, having, having a kind of a ch name calling uh, when it comes to China is something uh, for India, you know, to be playing into Chinese hands and playing into that narrative. So it, it is definitely against our interests. So I would expect Expect that this China agnosticism would continue. That's the first thing. But if you carefully see, uh, you know, Vedant about the expanse, I'm sure everybody here is discussing about how there's bipartisan support uh, for India. It's very, very clear, especially when you see, uh, I think, 2018 onwards, 2016 onwards, when we have signed these uh, uh, foundational uh, agreements that Vishnu also spoke about. But just uh, if I tell you that if you if you look at the defense uh, roadmap that we actually put together in 2023. You know, it is not just about the defense equipment. And when you read the details, you pro you probably understand that uh, why the strategic important uh, partnership is so important for India. It is from, uh, you know, sharing on the focus areas, you know, there's intelligence, there's surveillance and reconnaissance, of course, ISR, there's undersea domain awareness, which is very much related to the maritime domain awareness point that I was earlier telling you about. There's air combat and support, which is inclusive of aero engines, which, you know, then munition systems, etc., mobility. So what I'm saying is that uh, when you look carefully at all these details, you do see that China continues to be a very important point because of which there is convergence between India and the US. Mm. Uh, not to disregard that there is also bilateral uh, you know, convergence and there's also you know this wonderful trade relationship. By the way, a lot of people perhaps would not know that this uh, trade relationship that we have with the US, uh, a lot of times you'll see that US uh, sort of emerges as India's top most trading partner and then the next right. one probably is China back again and then this US is back again so on and so forth but a thing that is usually missed in these discussions is that our trade with the US uh, is also in our trade sub is ha we have a trade surplus there okay contrary to the relationship the trade relationship we have with other trading partners like China which is a huge deficit or for that matter with Russia with right. whom our trade deficit is ballooning because of the oil trade so I think this is one very yes. crucial I factor that, that is an important, lastly yeah Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, no, Vedad, I just wanted to conclude my point and say that, you know, ultimately one has to understand that an empowered and a stronger India in the Indo-Pacific is right now in the U.S. interest. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of understand that key point, you understand why there's bipartisan, uh, you know, consensus on India. And then you also understand why more than 50 percent of India's defense exports are actually going to the U.S., contrary to what a lot of people might imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's that's very well put that an empowered uh, India and the Indo-Pacific is in the US's interest. But, you know, keeping the focus now on the bilateral, well, these are pictures coming in of the Prime Minister's motorcade arriving at President Joe Biden's residence in Wilmington. Very symbolic in a sense that this bilateral is being held uh, at his residence in Wilmington for the first time, uh, President Biden hosting uh, leaders uh, at his residence. Um, Adele, come in on this point because, uh, you know, there are two key agreements uh, that we're looking at as well. Uh, one, of course, the economic framework and also the India-US drug framework. These are two key agreements um, that uh, could be inked as far as this bilateral bilateral is concerned and also an, an announcement expected on space cooperation. There's a lot of interest around that as well. So really new avenues being explored by the two partners. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing. And I think it was seven, eight years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, I was, you know, a member, part of the Raisina Dialogue in India. I was in Delhi. And even then we were talking about the importance of drug manufacturing taking place in, in places outside of China long before COVID even happened and supply chain disasters were, you know, coming to light. But 
Africa, Africa, India and Africa, of course, India's presence in Africa is another issue to be looked upon. Of course, China has a very strong presence there. But even re with regard to the drug and pharmaceutical manufacturing industry um, with the U.S.-India relationship, A, it will bring down, drive down costs. Also, it is a soft power move. It is absolutely a geopolitical tool in that regard of diplomacy, because what you have here also is India and China now competing and vying within Africa, another you know, entire continent for the very same things that China had a monopoly over previously. Um, you know, I, I also want to say, of course, in the in the um, national security perspective as well, it's so critically important to keep in mind that India is a much, much more trusted partner, a much more trusted ally. But I want to also point out, if I may, regarding the American Indian diaspora community in America, United States, that there is, you know, I don't know if you've heard of it, but House Resolution 1131, which actually celebrates and, and pushes back against the rise rising attacks against Indians, Hindu Americans especially as well. Um, it's against Hindu phobia. And I think that, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, it's obviously been an issue for, for decades now in the U.S., but because the Indian American diaspora has become so much more powerful and so much more of a mainstay mm. as part of America's fabric in recent years, unfortunately, the hatred and vitriol that's being cast towards them has similarly become elevated, which is a good thing because now the media has an opportunity to be to talk about it more sure. and hopefully put an end to it. Um, so it's it, a lot of stuff happening, you know. Yes, absolutely. There is a lot to sort of be uh, to, to look to look forward to but uh, Mr. Roy there are also challenges that need to be ironed out of course you briefly touched upon um, the Pannu issue uh, the also news came right ahead of the Prime Minister's arrival that the White House has hosted some pro Khalistan leaders so of course that is um, procedural given the fact that they were summoned um, but how do you see that Khalistan issue as far as the India US relationship is concerned do you expect it to be brought up uh, in the bilateral uh, can India and the US sit across the table and iron out its differences vis-a-vis -vis the Khalistan issue? Well, I don't expect uh, the Khalistan issue to be raised by the Prime Minister with the President, but I'm sure it will be brought up at the principal's oh, level, hear like her. the one layer her. below the National Security Advisors and the Foreign Minister level. It is striking that the White House should call this meeting the day before the Indian Prime Minister lands. Uh, so it uh, looks to me somewhat political to send a message and uh, sort of catering to their domestic political compulsions. The Sikh community here in the U.S., um, is pretty agitated uh, by the alleged uh, assassination plot. So uh, the government of India has to navigate this. Hopefully it can do it as smoothly it has been doing so far, but it is certainly a very delicate issue and can become a thorn. Um, but as I said before, there is a uh, a real attempt in this administration to keep the problems in silos, you know, to keep them aside, to let the larger relationship keep growing, getting stronger, etc., hmm. and not letting the problem areas to come in between. Right. But this is very noticeable that they should have called this meeting the day before. Right. But as you said earlier as well, that we are in a position where we have transcended these minor challenges. Uh, though of course, challenges do remain and they have to be ironed out. Uh, this is our top focus on NDTV. Thanks all very much uh, for joining us on the show this evening. Uh, Mr. Rohi, Adele uh, and, uh, you know, all of you for being here. Ms. Uh, uh, Swasti Rao as well. Uh, this, of course, is a crucial visit by the Prime Minister. A lot to unpack, a lot to decode. We will continue to track the story very, very closely for now. A short break.